I've spent far too much of my life dealing with drag and drop, especially when I was at Twitch. I get flashbacks and shit. I probably have straight up PTSD from how complex drag and drop is. And the harsh reality is that most people don't need those deep, complex, full UI navigation type drag and drop experiences. But in the rare times you do, if you want to be able to move component A from here to here, it shouldn't be as hard as it is. And that's why I'm really excited about the project I just stumbled on, Swappy. This seems to solve a lot of the generic drag and drop and reorganization problems. It's very different from the things I've built in the past, but I want to take the time to dig in. Meet Swappy, a framework agnostic tool to convert any layout into a drag to swap one with just a few lines of code. Handles the resizing as well. Interesting. So you define a slot, or in this case, multiple slots, and any components allowed to fit in any slot. Do you know what this is reminding me of already? There was a library I did a video about a while back called Auto Animate from the uh, Form Kit guys. This library is super cool. You can use it with things like drag and drop, but what Auto Animate does is you wrap a div, you make sure every element's identified in some way, using, usually with an ID or a key of some form, and then when you move things around with your JavaScript framework of choice, in this case, Native.js, nothing happens. It just doesn't give you any feedback. But when I use Auto Animate, it also doesn't do anything. It's because I have reduced motion on. Let me turn off reduced motion. There we go. Yeah, it's because I had reduced motion on. It's actually kind of cool that it honors your motion settings in the browser. Like that is a feature that I had reduced motion on on my Mac and that resulted in this not animating. That's a good thing, but I had to turn that off in order to show it. And now when we switch these around, you see they move and you can actually get a feeling of like what changed or if I remove something, like the smoothness of those animations or new thing. This is what auto animate does. If you want to see the code for how you integrate it, all you do to add auto animate is take a ref for the element you want it on and then auto animate that ref. That's it. Super, super easy. And in Native.js, it's even easier. In your script tag, you select the element and you call auto animate on that element and then you're done. It's so easy to use. And it seems like that's what they're going with here. It's a very similar vibe that I'm getting with Swappy so far. Let's see how you actually use it. You can install it with PNPM, or you can just embed it via a script tag. You know that they're going for everything if they give you a vanilla embed like this. Showing you a simple layout, but yours can be as complex as you want it to be. So you have slots. Interesting, they have the data swappy slot property for this. So you have data swappy item and data swappy slot, and then content for content B goes here, data swappy handle, and you bind it by grabbing the container, create swap before that container, and you can use dynamic or spring or none for the animation, and then you enable it. This is actually really useful, being able to enable and disable, because you can have like a lock for the UI, which is actually something, if we go back to mod view, that was one of the later ads that ended up being a really good change. We actually have an option in here for locking the UI. I don't know where it got moved to. Uh, here it is, the lock. So lock layout, now nothing drags, which is really handy if you don't want to accidentally screw up your, your layout. God, mod view is still the most beautiful thing Twitch ever made. I, I was partially responsible for getting it working, not for it being this beautiful. Huge shout out to the team, to Iris, and to everyone else responsible for making this such a stunning product. It's sad the best UI on Twitch is only for moderators, which is a very small percentage of Twitch's users. Anyways, listening to events. Swappy on swap, you can log things when the swaps happen. But I want to see this in React. So let's just download the repo and then grab the React example and play with it. Download zip. So I just rip, rip their example. I want to play with this a bit and try to break down why it's cool and more importantly, how it actually works. So uh, yeah, let's do that. Here we have A, C, and D. Note this empty spot. And I should be able to drag things to the different places. Seems like A does not want to drag unless I grab the handle, which is actually an interesting thing to have in the example. If I put something somewhere that something else is, it moves accordingly. So I put A where C is, it'll take that spot. Interesting that it goes different places depending on like how you do that. A little unintuitive, but still really cool that you can swap things around in that way. Let's read the code though, because that's where things get fun. So we have A, which is this div. It does not need to be wrapped in a fragment. None of these do. A little confused about that, but that's fine. Um, I'll resize so we have a little more room as well. So we have one is A, three is C, four is D, and two is null. So this is the default when you first load it. 
And all of these have a data swappy item key that tells you what these map to. So that swappy can use these IDs on these elements to know what is where and how to move things around. So you've get item by ID, takes in A, C, or D, and then we have the switch statement for if it's A, we return A, C, C, D, D. Okay, there's gonna be some fun bugs because of that, and I'll show those in a moment. Again, with these unnecessary fragments. Okay, so here we have the majority of the actual code. We have the slot items, which we're actually grabbing from local storage so that if you put something somewhere and then you refresh, it still knows where to put it because it pulled that value from local storage. That's actually really nice. Putting it here means that on every re-render it runs again, but at the very least local storage is fast, should be fine. JSON parsing is a little annoying, but again, fine for a starting point. Personally, I would have bumped this out and bound it outside so that it only has to run once, but to each their own. And then this use effect. We grab the container with the query selector, and then we bind it with create swappy. And then on swap, we update the local storage so that we have the new value. Don't love that way of doing this, but that's fine. We can work with it. I'll refactor this a bit, but first I wanna showcase a specific bug that this code will have. We're gonna change C. We're gonna have C have a count. Const count set count equals use state zero. I have to import use state. And now in here, we'll leave that, but we're gonna have a button and it shows the current count. And on click, we're going to set count to count plus one. So now when I click this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, if my hypothesis is correct, huh, fascinating. I was certain that was going to nuke the render. Console log, one, two, three, four, drag and drop. It doesn't re-render. Very interesting. Why do we need that switch statement then? Oh, we don't, it's just bad syntax, okay. Good to know, this example is really misleading. I might file a pull request with a better one. This is bad, don't do this this way. Do this. Oh no, because that's how you have to get the slot item. Yeah, that should uh, break actually, fuck, huh. Get item by ID, slot item one. This is so strange. Okay, I'm confused, that should be triggering a re-render when you're moving the JSX around. It says changes the child it's in. Why does that work? So effectively, the way that this works is React renders a template, so to speak, with all of these elements in all of these places. Then this use effect runs that identifies that container, makes it a swappy container, and then on swap updates local storage. The only reason this code makes any sense is because we have this local storage thing. If I literally just kill that and I change slot items or even just get rid of slot items, it instead we render A here, C here, and D here. Oh, one of these was null, right? I guess it didn't matter. Um, that one we'll leave as null and then this one will be D. Cool. Now we don't even need to keep the swappy and since we don't care, but this will all work as expected because the rendering state here, the reason those were all there and using that getter was just so that it could honor the local storage state of things that already existed, which is fascinating. And React doesn't seem to give a shit because I'm assuming it's leaving element references. Like what happened to this element's location? So we have slot one. If I move this, yeah, it's no longer a child of slot one. It's now a child of slot two. I am surprised React is as cool with this as it is. Usually React gets really mad when you change the relationship between the virtual DOM and the real DOM. Ooh, you know where things might get fun? Const global count set global count equals use state zero. Now let's make a button up here before the container. Okay, fine, his um, fragments were okay. Button on click equals set global count to global count plus one. And now when I click this, it increases. But what I wanna see is if I move these things, it's not even letting me move them now. Interesting, weird. If I remove this, will it? Is it just having that state broke it? Something else I do break it. Maybe you do need to actually have that and just didn't update. 
Yeah, it's possible that the code I was writing didn't actually persist into the browser because I'm using stack blitz. But I might have been right initially where these were re-rendering because now, now it's work. What the fuck? Okay, I am even more confused now. So if I bring back the state, save, refresh, that works. If I bring back the button, refresh, move, it works. But now when I do this. It still works. Very interesting. I was convinced having some state outside of it, potentially triggering a re-render here might break things. Gonna do something a little stupid. Key equals global count. Yeah, it does it. Okay. So React's keying can still break it. Yeah, since I, I updated this element, React didn't know what to do after, and that broke it. If I actually, I bet since this is a new element, if I was to rerun this on that, that would work. Cool. Yeah, that does it too. Interesting. Yeah. This might be one of those things where they're doing a little bit too much outside of React and you're going to hit these weird edge cases. Also, the state in the blue element, if I do this, that will nuke it. If I leave that, also nukes it. And if I get rid of that so that we're not rebinding swappy, I'll also get rid of this key. This should be fine. Increase that to three. And that won't trigger that to re-render because it's keyed and isolated properly. But like if I was passing props to container as its own thing, and one of those props changed, it could trigger this to re-render and break the binding here. And that's what's unintuitive, is if this query selector ever breaks for any reason, swappy breaks with it which is unintuitive. That's why you see a lot of things like this provide their own components to handle these edge cases for you. So they give you a container component that you would use instead. I get why they didn't. Their goal is to support vanilla JS stuff. And this is still really cool. I see a lot of use cases immediately for why this could or would be useful. But the potential to reach one of these broken states is a little bit high for my taste. Still a super cool thing and awesome seeing libraries like this that work for all frameworks instead of just React but it would be nice to see more React-y bindings. I also was linked DocView. And there's a couple other things like this, like on Twitch for ModView, we used React Mosaic, which was only part of the puzzle. We also used a lot of React drag and drop, but React Mosaic was a tiling window manager for managing which windows are where. It does everything with a binary tree with percentage splits. So there are nodes that have left and right or top and bottom. It's, it's one and two is what it actually has. And it has a percentage and vertical or horizontal. They have a demo here, cool. So this, this tree would have one node at the top, which is a node that has window one, window two, split horizontal, percentage 50-ish. And if I add another node, now we have the first node, which is split uh, with node one is window one, node two, is another binary node that has window two, window three. That one's vertically split 50. This one's horizontally split 50, but it's just a tree that describes this. I bet if we look at the console, they might even show it. Be nice if they did. Yeah, see direction row, first one, second two, split percentage, split percentage. And when you move it around, it will change. So now one is the first node, second is another split node. This one's direction column, first three, second two. If I move this back, now it's two, three again, and you'll see second, first two, second three, direction column. I could also do this, and now it's gonna be a row split here. A direction row, first two, second three. And if I do that, now it's going to be with a percentage, 61%. So this whole thing is really basic binary nodes. The catch here is when you change the layout, things break. Like this might be wide enough here, but there it's not because we're not setting minimum or maximum widths or percentages. We're setting a percentage based on what available screen real estate there is. So yeah, React Mosaic's super cool. We use it a ton at Twitch. Good solution for that aspect of things, but it's very much you have a full space and you want the user to have this specific windowing, tiling, mosaic style. Doc view looks a little different. It's similar, but they have a concept of tabs. They have a concept of pop-outs and a lot of these other things. Super cool. I believe it's also framework agnostic. Yeah, React View and vanilla TypeScript. And also D&D Kit, which is phenomenal. React Beautiful drag and drop is really outdated. I'd recommend avoiding it. I've gotten in trouble for that in the past. The thing I want to show here 
D&D kit is in a phenomenal state. Do they have examples here? Yeah. You can make draggables and droppables with really simple syntax. You have to have the D&D context to let things know that they're draggable and droppable. That's weird cursor. But droppable has to have an ID. Draggable is this element that we define here. Go ahead, drag me. And handle drags a function that does something. A little sus that they return here, and then this is written there. Just weird ways of writing this, but it makes sense. You set the parent for over to be over ID when that's the case, and then parent, droppable or draggable. Not the best example, but I promise React Beautiful D&D, when you actually get it set up and you use it right, it's great. Fantastic library, highly recommend. That's all I think I have to say on this one. Swappy looks dope for specific things, has a couple edge cases to look out for in React. If you want more of a layout style thing, you can use DocView or React Mosaic. If you want more primitive drag and drop, D&D kit's the way to go. Swappy is a niche in between that really has that auto animate feel. But for a lot of things, I could see this being really, really useful. Let me know what you guys think. And until next time, peace nerds.